I am Rob Burgess. I head up business development for Sino Biological. And I would like to officially welcome all of the attendees and specifically our speaker to the very first installment in our series called BioTalk Tuesdays, where we hear about cutting edge technologies as well as discoveries in basic biomedical sciences. In just one minute, I'm gonna introduce our esteemed speaker, but before I do that, I just wanna to mention to everyone that we have one primary housekeeping issue for this webinar series. It works best if you actually enter your questions into the chat box. And then at the end of this seminar, I will verbally walk through all of the questions and get as many of those answered by our speaker as we can. Also, feel free to just say hello and say where you're from. It's always interesting to see from all over the world where everybody is attending our seminar series. So thank you for that. I can see that we've already got a great turnout. And without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our esteemed speaker to, again, the first installment in the BioTalk Tuesday series for Sinobiological, and that is Dr. Kiara Clayton. Dr. Clayton is an assistant professor in the Department of Patho Pathology at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. And she focuses on HIV infected macrophages with killer cells of the immune system, with specialization including CD8 positive T cells and natural killer cells. Dr. Clayton received her BS in biochemistry with honors, as well as her doctorate in immunology at the University of Toronto. And following this, she completed her postdoctoral fellowship under the advisement of Dr. Bruce Walker at the Reagan Institute of Massachusetts General Hospital at MIT and Harvard. And this was completed in 2021. And so the title of Dr. Clayton's talk today is Macrophages, Hideouts for HIV and Drivers of Inflammation. And with that, Dr. Clayton, I will stop sharing my screen and turn the screen over to you. Okay. Okay, can everyone see that? Yes, looks great. Okay, excellent. Well, thanks, Rob, for the introduction, and I really appreciate the chance to talk with you all today about some of the research that, um, you know, I did as a, a postdoctoral fellow, which I'm, I'm mostly going to highlight, but then also the kind of uh, plans that we have in the new lab, which started up uh, back at UMass Medical School in July. Um, so today we're going to talk about HIV infection, but also a little bit of a focus on macrophages and how we found that they're this hard-to-kill cell types that, that helps viruses, including HIV, um, persist. So um, let's start by talking about macrophages. So macrophages are immune cells, specifically tissue resident immune cells. So they're not found in the blood and they're classified based on which the tissues that they reside. So for example, long lived macrophages in the brain are called the microglia. You have the ones in the skin called the Langerhans cells and the specialized macrophages of the liver are called the Kupfer cells. And um, once they actually get into the tissues, um, they differentiate um, and they can perform different functions. And this differentiation is dependent upon a few different factors. So first is their origin. Um, so macrophages can actually derive from a couple of different precursors. The first one is yolk sac derived macrophages, um, which develop during early embryonic development and they seed certain tissues. And for macrophages that develop into microglia in the brain, these can actually um, result in a, uh, a long-lived uh, macrophage uh, population within the brain that's self-renewing, but other ones like the intestinal macrophages, the liver macrophages, for example, um, they die off during a, a period of time during uh, development. But then in addition to these yolk sac derived macrophages, you also have um, monocytes, which you can find in the blood and during sterile inflammation and tissue injury and infection, any sort of inflammation, they can actually infiltrate into the tissues and take on uh, similar forms to these tissue resident macrophages. Um, but the monocyte derived macrophages are, are not so long lived. So they're not those self renewing macrophages that you will find um, within the tissues. Once they actually get into the tissues, the signals that they receive from the environment um, 
they can coordinate uh, their differentiation. Of course, that's going to be different depending on, you know, which tissue that they're in. The time of residency in the tissue can also affect their differentiation, as well as signals that they see from receive from inflammation, which includes um, pathogen-mediated inflammation, as well as uh, sterile injury. And the macrophages really act to clear dead cell and debris, you know, they're phagocytes, but they're also involved in a lot of tissue and gut homeostasis and repair. In the, in the case of the brain, the microglia are also involved in synaptic pruning. Um, they can phagocytose foreign invaders such as bacteria and viruses. And then they can also coordinate different aspects of the immune response um, as professional antigen presenting cells. And that's mostly what we're gonna focus on today in the context of macrophages as professional antigen presenting cells, but also in the context of inflammation. So the way that people used to think about macrophage differentiation and polarization was very binary. So on one end of the spectrum, you would have M1 macrophages, which were pro-inflammatory, M2 being the alternatively activated macrophages, or some people call them anti-inflammatory, with M0 macrophages being this kind of differentiated but non-polarized state. But the way that we understand macrophage polarization and differentiation nowadays is actually it exists on a spectrum. So on one part of the spectrum, we have wound healing macrophages, which are involved in a lot of tissue repair and uh, homeostasis. But if their function is left unchecked, this can lead to a lot of fibrosis and allergies and asthma. On another part of the spectrum, we have our pro-inflammatory macrophages, which are involved in coordinating responses to bacteria and viruses. But if the function of pro-inflammatory macrophages is left unchecked, this can contribute to the development of cardiovascular disease, as well as different autoimmune disorders. And then an extreme version of pro-inflammatory macrophages on awry is called macrophage activation syndrome, which is characterized by a massive cytokine storm of IL-6, IL-1, TNF-alpha, and um, other activation markers. And this is actually seen in the case of pathogenic COVID-19, Ebola virus disease, as well as some complications due to cancer cell therapies, including CAR T cell therapies. So this really, this really emphasizes the need to understand, you know, how this pro-inflammatory um, macrophage phenotype is regulated um, by the immune system. So in terms of macrophages as professional antigen presenting cells, I, I mentioned that they were phagocytes first and foremost. So they can phagocytose foreign material and sense pathogens uh, through stimulation of toll-like receptors as well as other pattern recognition receptors. Once they're stimulated, they can actually activate NK cells through various surface receptors, as well as the cytokines that they produce, um, but they can also stimulate T cells. So this foreign antigen um, can be broken up in the phagosome and presented on MHC class one for cross presentation and MHC class two. Peptides presented on MHC class one can activate CD8 T cells. Peptides presented on MHC class two can activate CD4 T cells. Um, and so this helps uh, coordinate the immune response. But what's interesting is that there are certain pathogens that lead to a development of acute disease, um, such as Ebola and SARS-CoV-2, which do infect um, some uh, types of macrophages, not all macrophages, but some macrophages. And it's curious whether um, infection of macrophages can actually drive inflammation in the context of these disease. Obviously, SARS-CoV-2 doesn't cause pathogenic disease for everybody, but we know that activation of macrophages, which has gone awry, um, is part of the pathogenesis for people that get really severe disease. But apart from these acute pathogens, there are also some other chronic pathogens such as HIV, mycobacterium tuberculosis, and human cytomegalovirus, which establish chronic infections. But what's interesting is all three of these also infect macrophages. And while each of them has a pathogen-specific immunoevasion mechanism to persist, the question is, what makes macrophages ideal hosts for these pathogens? Not just the chronic pathogens, but also the acute pathogens. Um, and to try and get at the, the answer of this question, uh, we focus primarily on HIV. So today I'm gonna to be talking about two projects, um, just a, a brief summary of one of them and then go into more detail for the other. The first project, um, uh, is a story looking at CD8 T cell interactions with um, macrophages. And what I'm going to show you is that CD8 T cells, um, in the context of HIV infected macrophages, they can recognize and they try and kill macrophages through release of perfin and granzymes at the immunological synapse, but that macrophages express granzyme inhibitors to help resist this killing.
What's interesting, though, is that uh, for CD8 T cells, once you um, contact your target and you sense it and you release your perforin and granzyme, if you have a slow killing event, the CD8 T cell actually stays stuck to the target cell. And this prolonged interaction results in hypersecretion of pro-inflammatory cytokines like interferon gamma, and then this can further activate the macrophage. So this leads, this inefficient killing event leads to a um, a lot of inflammation. So the question that we wanted to ask next was whether innate cytolytic cells, such as NK cells, could potentially do a better job. And so for this, uh, we studied um, NK cell interactions with HIV infected macrophages. I'm going to show you that NK cells use innate receptors to recognize HIV infected macrophages, but the, the macrophages trigger more an NK cell cytokine production response uh, while limiting perforin and granzyme release. And altogether, we think that this macrophage resistance to killing is what makes them ideal hosts for pathogens, obviously for HIV, but we also have interest in looking at other pathogens that infect um, macrophages including tuberculosis and Ebola virus. Um, so just a little bit of a background on HIV. So despite the fact that we have um, antiretroviral therapy, which is highly effective at uh, limiting the viral loads in the blood, there's still about 38 million people who are infected with HIV. Not all of them have access to the antiretroviral therapy drugs, and we, we're still getting about 1.5 5 million new infections per year. And even with the antiretroviral drugs, we are still getting just shy of 700,000 AIDS-related deaths in 2020. So it is still important um, to really characterize this disease, characterize the pathogenesis of the disease, not, not just so that we can learn how to prevent it with vaccines, but also um, treat it and potentially develop a cure. So in terms of HIV disease pathogenesis, when you initially get infected by HIV, you have this increase in plasma viral load during the acute stage of infection. It infects, primarily infects CD4 T cells of the immune system, which is why you see this initial drop in your CD4 T cell count. During the acute infection stage though, your CD8 T cells will, will chime in and try to control the virus. Um, and after this acute stage of infection, because the CD8 T cells are not able to completely eliminate the virus, this results in the clinical late latency stage where you kind of get this back and forth between the virus and the um, CD8 T cell response. But during this stage, you gradually lose your CD4 T cells um, until it gets to about um, 250 cells per mil in which case you would actually um, be classified as having acquired immunodeficiency. Now, as I mentioned, we have combined antiretroviral therapy, which effectively lowers blood viral loads to undetectable levels. But I do want to point out that the therapy is not a cure. So if you stop taking the medication, which has come down to one pill a day, which isn't too bad, but if you stop taking medication, this will result in resurgence of viremia and progression to AIDS. Um, interestingly, while the people that are taking this medication do appear relatively healthy compared to the people that don't, you know, they have a rescue um, of their CD4 T cell counts for some people, um, they still exhibit elevated levels of inflammation. And this inflammation can result in an increased risk of comorbidities, including the development of cardiovascular disease and certain neurocognitive disorders, diabetes, cancer, liver disease. Um, so it does emphasize that we need to understand um, why we still have inflammation during treated HIV infection so that we can learn how to treat it. So I had mentioned the control of HIV infection during the acute stage of infection, as well as the chronic stage of infection. And this is where CD8 T cells are really important. So a cytolytic CD8 T cell is a T cell that can recognize an HIV infected target through peptide, uh, viral peptide presented on MHC class one. The TCR recognizes this peptide MHC complex there is an immunological synapse formed between your CD8 T cells and your infected target cells, and this results in release of perforin and granzymes at the immunological synapse and target cell killing. Now, essential to this is also proliferation of the CD8 T cell response, so that you're able to renew your effector cells so that you can have more soldiers that end up killing um, off your infected cells. And secondary to this is the production of antiviral cytokines and chemokines. And today I'm going to be talking about certain antiviral cytokines, such as um, interferon gamma, as well as pro-inflammatory um, TNF-alpha. Now, again, as I had mentioned during the acute stage of infection, the CD8 T cells initially try to control the virus, which results in a viral set point. So this is where your plasma viral load levels off. Um, but what happens with the virus is because you have the CD8 T cell pressure, the virus can actually escape by mutating the peptides that are presented on this MHC class one. And it's this escape that allows, um, that basically allows the CD8 T cell 
um, to not recognize the HIV infected target. And so during this clinical latency stage, you have this development of the CD8 T cell response escaped by the virus, development of the T cell response escaped by the virus. But eventually, because the CD8 T cells end up getting stimulated over and over again, this results in T cell exhaustion and eventual progression to AIDS. Now, as part of uh, my postdoctoral work with um, Dr. Bruce Walker at the Reagan Institute, his primary focus was on um, elite controllers. So these are very rare individuals that develop very special CD8 T cell responses that specifically, uh, well, they initially control the virus, but they specifically target constrained parts of the virus so that it's difficult for the virus to actually escape without any sort of massive fitness cost. And because you're able to um, target constrained parts of the virus, you get better control, you get maintenance of antiviral function, um, so no T-cell exhaustion and lack of progression to AIDS. It's really optimal control of HIV infection um, is a result of targeting viral epitopes within mutationally constrained parts of the viral proteins, as well as maintenance of antiviral function. But I do want to point out that actually, if your T cells become exhausted, uh, you will eventually um, lose control of the virus and you will progress to AIDS. And this actually does happen um, with some controllers who eventually lose control. So that's the CD8 T cell control of HIV infection. But what about the cells that are infected themselves? So um, any, uh, the HIV reservoir can be defined as any cell that can harbor virus, it can reseed infection and, and persist despite antiretroviral therapy. And, you know, it's well known in the field that CD4 T cells are the main targets for HIV infection, and they exhibit some um, different characteristics that allow them to evade immunity. So for example, they can um, become latently infected. So this is when a cell can become infected. And if it doesn't die from the cytopathic effects of the virus, it can become very rested, very quiescent, in which case the, um, the immune system can't actually see it because it's transcriptionally inactive. Um, but the other thing too is HIV infected CD4 T cells can hide out in immunologically privileged sites such as the, uh, the lymphoid follicle here, which is largely uh, deficient of CD8 T cells or NK cells, anything that's really cytolytic. Um, but in addition to CD4 T cells, of course, today we're going to focus on macrophages. And macrophages do express CD4 and CCR5, and we can take HIV and we can infect them in vitro. But there's um, a ton of evidence to show that HIV-infected macrophages can be found in the tissues during antiretroviral therapy. And a lot of people will say that macrophage infection by HIV is a little bit controversial. I want to point out that it's just difficult to study the macrophages because, as I mentioned before, HIV infected macrophages are only found in the tissues. You're not going to find these kinds of cells in the blood. So, when it comes to um, studying these in uh, people with HIV, you know, we really are limited by the samples that we can get with only um, blood samples from most of our. Um, subjects that are involved in different studies, we're not going to get the macrophages. You really need special studies in order to actually get the tissues. But for the studies that do get the tissues, we do find HIV-infected macrophages. We also have animal models such as SIV infection of macaques, um, in which case we've shown that replication-competent um, virus can be derived from the macrophages. But beyond actual reservoirs, we know that macrophages are important in their um, contribution to inflammation in the context of neurological disorders, as well as cardiovascular disease. But in the context of reservoir formation, um, you know, the macrophages have certain characteristics that help um, the virus persist. So for example, macrophages can store virus within this small virus containing compartment, which is largely protected from HIV um, antibodies. So there's no way for the virus to actually be cleared by the adaptive immune system in terms of B cells and antibodies. The macrophages can also resist the cytopathic effects of the infection. So unlike CD4 T cells, which after about three to four days of infection, the majority of them die. Um, HIV infection actually prolongs the life of, HIV, of, of the macrophages themselves. And what's more is that um, some early work by Mario Stevenson's group had suggested that SIV infected macrophages, so this is the macaque version of HIV, um, they actually resist killing by CD8 T cells which can obviously lead to persistence. And this is what we really got interested um, on early on. And it led us to a few different questions. So first, are HIV infected macrophages resistant to CD8 T cell mediated killing? Or is this just an effect of the um, SIV infection itself and not HIV infection? Is this resistance an intrinsic characteristic of macrophages or is it restricted to HIV? What are the mechanisms of killing and resistance? And what are the consequences of poor killing?
And so I'm just going to go over um, a paper that we published back in 2018, which really describes the um, CD8 T cell interaction with CD4 T cells and macrophages. So what we found was that when um, CD8 T cells uh, come into contact with an HIV infected CD4, they um, form immunological synapses and they re release perforin and granzyme at the immunological synapse. And this results in very efficient killing. So the CD4 T cells um, can be killed on the order of minutes, if not just uh, an hour or two. And because you have this efficient killing event, you have very efficient detachment of the dead cell um, from your CTL. And because you don't have this prolonged contact time, you get a little bit of pro-inflammatory cytokine production, um, but still not a lot. This is in sharp contrast to what we have um, with the macrophage scenario. So for HIV infected macrophages, the CD8 T cells are able to recognize um, the HIV infected macrophages. They form very strong immunological synapses. They release perforin and granzyme at the immunological synapses. But interestingly, the macrophages resist granzymes um, through expression of serpent B9. And because they resist this cell death, this results in either an inefficient killing event or a macrophage that isn't killed at all. And without that killing event and that signal for detachment, the CTL stays in contact with the macrophage. This prolonged contact time results in hypersecretion of pro-inflammatory cytokines, such as interferon gamma. And as we all know, like the interferon gamma is a strong, very potent activator of macrophages. So this actually acts back on the macrophage to drive a pro-inflammatory macrophage response, which we suggest contributes to this elevated inflammation that we see within the context of HIV infection. So it seems that with our CD8 T cells, we have inefficient killing and we have this excessive pro-inflammatory response. So we next wanted to ask whether there was a way that we could enhance killing so that we get you know, more efficient detachment, more efficient killing to limit the inflammation. And this is where we became really interested in NK cells because NK cells naturally express very high levels of perforin and granzyme. So if we were to take um, NK cells from any of you in this, um, the seminar right now, if I were to take them and look at expression of perforin and granzymes directly from the blood, the NK cells will have the highest levels of perforin and granzyme compared to your CD8 T cells taken directly from the blood. Or even if I take the CD8 T cells and I stimulate them in vitro to express higher levels of perforin and granzyme, the NK cells here will always win in terms of co-expression of both of the molecules. So then we wanted to ask whether NK cells could recognize and kill HIV infected macrophages while limiting inflammation. And again, this all comes down to the contact time between the NK cell and the macrophage. If you have higher levels of perforin and granzyme, will this result in more efficient killing and less inflammation? So just a little bit of a background on NK cells and HIV infection. So for a healthy target cell, so something that's not cancerous, something that's um, not virally infected, anything like that, you have high expression of um, self-peptide presented on MHC class one. So the NK cell can form a synapse or form a contact with this healthy target, but it engages inhibitory receptors on the NK cell, such as NKG2A or cure molecules. And this results in inhibition of the NK cell, which then protects the target. So you don't have release of perforin and granzymes. This is in contrast to what we have with a scenario when the NK cell is recognizing an HIV infected target. So I mentioned for CD8 T cells that um, viral peptide is presented on MHC class one to stimulate um, the T cell receptor, but actually there are certain accessory proteins such as NEF and VPU that downregulate this MHC class one to help evade um, CTL mediated immunity. But what's interesting is when you have this lower level of MHC class one, this disengages the inhibitory receptors. And so this results in an overall um, less inhibitory um, signal towards the NK cells, which triggers them to kill the target, but then also produce um, pro-inflammatory cytokines such as interferon gamma and TNF-alpha and chemokines such as MYP1-beta. Now, in addition to this, HIV-infected targets can upregulate stress ligands such as um, MYC-A and B and the ULBP1 through 6, and this can activate the NK cells through activating receptors such as NKG2D. And again, this can... Um, this can enhance the NK cell killing of the HIV infected target. Now together, um, this represents the innate NK cell function. So this doesn't, these, uh, the disengagement of the inhibitory receptors and the stimulation of the activating receptors, none of this depends on a prior infection or a memory response. If I were to take NK cells from 
any of you in, in this audience, urine K cells will have natural antiviral activity due to these innate functions. But because HIV-infected targets can also express HIV envelope on the surface, people that are infected who develop HIV antibodies, um, these antibodies can bind to the surface of infected cells through recognition of this envelope and stimulate the NK cells uh, through CD16, and this is called antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. So really the NK cells can actually act as a bridge between innate immunity, which doesn't require memory, um, and adaptive immunity through using antibodies to recognize um, surface uh, viral blood proteins. In terms of um, HIV infection, we know that there are certain um, NK cell cure and HLA-B alleles that are associated with slower progression to AIDS. But what, what I think is really interesting is the fact that because you have this innate NK cell function, I think where NK cells are going to be most important is actually during this very early acute stage of infection. And we do know that there are NK cell correlates of protection in highly exposed seronegative individuals. So these are um, individuals who are um, known to be in, in high risk positions, such as sex workers, um, who do have um, high exposure to HIV infection, but they never actually develop HIV infection. And so there's um, some people in the field that suggest that they could have um, strong NK cell responses that help protect them um, from the virus disseminating. So uh, we, in terms of um, studying NK cells and their interactions with macrophages and CD4 T cells, uh, we have a particular setup to look at co-culture between the two cells. So all of this is done in a BSL2 plus tissue culture because we are dealing with live HIV, we are dealing with human samples. Um, we get our um, human blood from healthy donors and from these healthy donor PBMCs, so peripheral blood mononuclear cells, we can isolate our monocytes, we can isolate our CD4 T cells, and these are the pre cursors to the cells that will be infected. We take our monocytes and we mature them into macrophages using GMCSF and MCSF, and we activate the CD4 T cells using CD3 antibody and CD28 antibody. So this is going to stimulate the T cells through the T cell receptor, and we include in a little bit of IL-2 for um, expansion and survival of the T cells. After about seven days of maturation and activation, uh, we perform an HIV infection with our favorite strain of um, HIV called 89.6, and we perform the infection for three days. We then take PBMCs that are autologous, so this is just going to be um, frozen uh, material down from um, the same cells that we used for the isolation of the monocytes and the CD4 T cells. We rest these PBMCs, and then the next day we isolate them directly through negative selection. So these are just um, kits that you can buy. And uh, we also isolate CD8 T cells uh, from healthy donors um, as a control, and I'll get into that a little bit later. But once we have our NK cells and we have our infected um, CD4 T cells in our macrophages, then we perform our co-culture assays. So it's just putting the NK cells together with the infected cells and then using flow cytometry to look at um, the macrophage response to the NK cells. So are you seeing a loss of the infected cells, which would indicate killing? We also look at the NK cell response. So are the NK cells recognizing the infected cells? We use imaging flow cytometry to look at the interaction between um, your effector cells, your CD8 T cell and your NK cell, and your um, macrophage target or your CD4 T cell target. And then we also perform some live cell imaging, and this is relatively new, where we can put in uh, fluorescently labeled NK cells that's here in the yellow and look at um, cell death, which will be here in the blue for the HIV infected cell. And we'll get into some of that in a little bit. So the first co-culture assay is called an elimination assay, and we use this to measure the NK cell mediated killing of HIV infected targets. So again, for a co-culture assay, you're going to take your HIV infected macrophage and CD4 T cell targets. You're going to put them together with our NK cell effectors for either four hours or sometimes we do overnight or 48 hours. And then we use flow cytometry to look at um, killing of the infected population. So for flow cytometry, you can use CD4 versus HIV gag P24 to indicate the infected cells. So um, HIV gag is the HIV structural protein antigen. So only cells that are infected will be gag P24 positive. We also look at CD4 because HIV infected cells, once you have a post integration event, um, Accessory proteins such as VPU and NEF actually downregulate CD4. Um, so the cells that are CD4 downregulated, GAG P24 positive, these are the cells that are producing viral antigens. These are the ones that are producing a full virus and are the ones that are going to be targeted by your NK cells.
So if our NK cells indeed are antiviral, we should expect to see a loss of this particular um, population. So we first wanted to do a control and just confirm that, you know, our system is working. Um, and so for this, we took CD8 T cells from our healthy donors. And these healthy donors have never been exposed to HIV. They are not HIV positive. So they have no CD8 T cells that have developed that are specific to HIV. So what we would expect to see here is that with the addition of our CD8 T cells, we see no killing. And that's exactly what we saw. So from our healthy donors, the CD8 T cells don't exhibit anti any antiviral activity towards the CD4 T cells or towards the macrophages. This is in sharp contrast to what we see with the NK cells. So again, uh, we're putting together our NK cells with our infected CD4s in black or infected macrophages in red. And you can see that with the addition of the CD4 T cells, you do see a drop in the, the level of infection for CD4s, but not much happens with the macrophages. This is true for a four-hour cold culture, and actually, in order to see any macrophage killing at all, you need to extend the cold culture to overnight, and even with that, you need to have higher effector-to-target ratios, so um, higher levels of NK cells uh, versus the target cells itself to enhance um, the killing of the infected cells. So next, we wanted to see um, how the NK cells were recognizing or, or if the NK cells were actually recognizing the infected cells or not, and if this was the cause of the killing. So again, for this, we're performing our co-culture assay with our macrophage and CD4 T cell targets with our NK cells for six hours. Um, but for this, we use full cytometry to look at the NK cells instead of the infected cells. So we're looking at CD107A, which is a marker of degranulation. So CD107A will mark the cells that have released their perforin and granzymes at the immunological synapse. In addition, we look at either TNF-alpha or interferon gamma as kind of like a secondary cytokine response. And what you would expect is that if the NK cells are recognizing their targets, you would see an increase into granulation. Again, that's going to be released to perforin and granzyme at the immunological synapse, as well as cytokine production. Again, just starting off with our control, CD8 T cells from the healthy donors um, did not degranulate. They did not produce any TNF-alpha, indicating that the CD8 T cells, uh, from healthy donors at least, are not seeing HIV-infected um, CD4 T cells or the macrophages. For the NK cells, um, you can see that the NK cells uh, are degranulating and producing a little bit of cytokine in response to uninfected CD4 T cells, which is pretty typical with what we see in our assays. But this does increase significantly when you um, incubate the NK cells with HIV-infected CD4 T cells. You see this increase in CD107A and TNF-alpha production. Now, when you co-culture the NK cells with uninfected macrophages, you see a little bit less degranulation and, and cytokine compared to what we see with the CD4s, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but with the co-culture of the infected macrophages, you do see a significant increase um, in the degranulation and cytokine production. So the NK cells are able to recognize both the infected CD4 T cells and the infected macrophages. Now, when you get rid of this background response that you see here um, to the uninfected targets, so the CD107A and TNF-alpha response, um, you can see that there's actually no difference in the ability of the NK cell to detect an infected CD4 uh, versus an infected um, macrophage. But what's really interesting is that when you start looking at the ratio of CD107A, so that release of perforin and granzyme at the immunological synapse compared to just cytokine production, the NK cells responding to the CD4 T cells are far more cytolytic or far, they have far more of a killer function um, than the ones responding to the macrophage. And so we think that this is why you're not getting as much killing of the macrophages versus um, the strong, efficient killing that you see of the CD4 T cells. And one thing I want to point out, kind of like what we saw with the CD8 T cells, is that you're getting this massive pro-inflammatory cytokine response, so interferon gamma in the macrophage cold cultures uh, with the NK cells versus the CD4 T cell cold cultures. So this agrees with our whole um, model where you have this inefficient killing event, which results in more pro-inflammatory cytokine production versus an, an efficient killing event like what we see with CD4 is where you get significantly less um, interferon gamma production. So 
it was a little bit disappointing that we saw the NK cells just weren't able to recognize or be as functional towards the macrophages versus the CD4 cells. But as I mentioned before, there's the innate um, NK cell activity, but then there's also ADCC activity, in which case you can use HIV specific antibodies to potentially overcome the block in the NK cell cytolytic response. But here's the complication with the macrophages. So it's quite, it's known quite well in the field that um, HIV actually buds into this internal virus containing compartment. So it's not really a cytoplasmic compartment, but it's more of an invagination, a plasma, uh, plasma membrane invagination, where you have this internal compartment that basically accumulates a lot of the virions. And so it was really unclear whether there was any surface exposed um, HIV glycoprotein that was on the surface. And then of course, ADCC requires surface exposed HIV envelope in order for the antibodies to recognize the infected cell. Um, so we, we adapted some of our flow cytometry assays to, to look at the HIV-infected CD4 T cells or macrophages, but culturing the CD4 T cells or the macrophages with HIV-specific antibodies. So we use CD19 as our negative control because neither of the cells express CD19. And then we used an array of different HIV um, binding antibodies. And the, the binding site here is not quite relevant, but just to show that we have a different array of HIV um, antibodies. And what we would expect is that if the HIV antibodies are recognizing the infected cells, you would see the shift in the histogram um, infected population as what we see here with CD4s and the macrophages. And this is actually the case where the HIV um, antibodies were able to recognize both the macrophages and the CD4 T cells in the case of PGT-121, which is our favorite antibody. Um, but there are other cases where you don't actually see a lot of recognition, like with 3BNC-117, um, for example. So it does appear that at least when we stain the cells at four degrees, that there is HIV um, envelope or the viral glycoprotein that's present on the surface of the cell. So to determine whether um, you know, the surface expression was stable or not, we used imaging flow cytometry to perform a, a time course to see you know, if, this, if the expression of HIV envelope was stable at the surface or if it was potentially brought into the internal virus containing compartment. And so for imaging flow cytometry, you can run it just like a typical flow cytometer where you stain for intracellular gag, you stain uh, you, uh, for um, the HIV envelope using an HIV specific antibody, and then you can actually calculate um, whether you have internalization of your envelope probe or whether um, it stays on the surface. And we use CD33 as kind of our reference surface marker here. So you can see for this, um, and again, this is flow cytometry, but with imaging flow cytometry, um, the instrument actually takes an image with up to 12 different channels of every event that goes through the cytometer. So if you ever get to use one of these, definitely give it a try because it's, it's extremely powerful. It gives you a lot of information, information. So you can see that when we first stain the cells at four degrees with our HIV antibody, it's primarily on the surface. So it overlaps very nicely with CD33, which is our surface stain. After you wash the antibody out, if you perform a, a time course at uh, 37 degrees for 10 minutes, for 30 minutes or 60 minutes, you can see that the envelope gets rapidly internalized. Even at 10 minutes, you can see the internalization. And this is true if you use um, two different HIV specific antibodies, which recognize different epitopes on the surface of the viral glycoprotein. Um, so we use GAG as kind of our positive control for internal staining. Again, the CD33 is our surface staining and you can calculate the internalization um, over time. So it appears like the envelope is initially expressed on the surface, but then brought in um, to this internal compartment very rapidly. And just to confirm that the internal compartment is the virus containing compartment, uh, we stained our HIV infected macrophages with this um, J3 nanobody, which is directly linked with Alexa 647 at 37 degrees for one hour. And then we washed it out and then performed confocal microscopy where we fixed the cells and we stained them for um, intracellular gag P20 Four, as well as different compartment markers. So um, the HIV envelope stain, so your J3 is going to be here in the orange, and you can see that the gag and envelope almost 100% overlap, so very high Pearson correlation coefficient. But when we start looking at the overlap between the envelope and different compartment markers, such as the early endosome, you don't really get much overlap. We also looked at LAMP1, which is a marker of the lysosome. Again, not much overlap. 
Then we looked at SIGLEC1 or CD169, which is a marker of the virus containing compartment. And as you can see here, um, it's not a perfect overlap, um, but the Pearson correlation coefficient is significantly higher um, than what you would see with either EEA1 or LAMP1, suggesting that the HIV envelope does start off at the surface, but then it gets rapidly internalized into the virus containing compartment. So then we wanted to know whether this transient surface expression of the HIV envelope was sufficient to trigger this ADCC function. Now, I had mentioned that the NK cell can be triggered by a lot of different things. So you have your cure receptors, you have NKG2D. The problem with NK cells and ADCC is it's not necessarily um, the antibody um, that the NK cell could recognize um, as its only signal. It's gonna be recognizing a bunch of different things. Um, so to determine whether this um, HIV envelope binding to um, an antibody fragment was sufficient to actually result in a receptor triggering or receptor clustering to trigger the cell, uh, we used chimeric antigen receptors. So chimeric antigen receptors basically express um, fragments of antibodies, or in the case of um, the HIV CD4, D1, D2, this is... Um, a version of the HIV receptor. So these antibody fragments and this receptor are able to bind to HIV envelope. And if you get um, dimerization or if you get multiplomerization of these particular receptors, this can actually trigger signaling and activation of the CAR T cell. Um, so what we would expect is that with our HIV specific CAR T cells, it recognizes HIV envelope on the surface of infected cells and it results in T cell activation. And we use CD19 here as our negative control because as I mentioned before, we know that CD19 is not expressed by the CD4 T cells or the macrophages. So when we perform that co-culture assay again, but we look at the response of the CAR T cells, you can see that again, looking at CD107A and TNF alpha, we're not getting responses to the infected CD4s or macrophages, which is great. That's our negative control. And then you can see that um, with the addition of the infected CD4 T cells, good degranulation, cytokine production. So the CAR T cell is able to recognize the infected um, CD4 T cell, but it's also able to recognize the infected macrophage. And when we do this across multiple donors, you can see that there's no difference in the ability of the CAR T cells to recognize either the infected CD4 T cell or the macrophage, which would indicate that the HIV envelope is equally accessible on the surface of either infected target cell. And just to kind of follow up on that a little bit, um, we also showed that the CAR T cells were actually quite potent um, killers of the HIV infected macrophages. So you can see this is the killing after a four hour co culture. So for some of these, you actually got loss of almost half of the ma macrophage population. And with our PGT 121, so again, this is our favorite antibody or antibody fragment, you can see that we get um, great killing of the HIV infected macrophages as well as CD4 is much better than what we have um, with the NK cells. So if people are potentially thinking about therapeutics, I would definitely say CAR T cells are one of our best bets. So ADCC, so the use of the antibody to trigger the NK cells when you're co-cultured with the infected macrophages, we first wanted to get a sense of how efficient um, the ADCC would be um, when we co-cultured the NK cells with our infected CD4 T cells versus the macrophages. So this is when we played around a little bit with our live cell imaging. So we took our NK cells, we stained them with an orange cell tracker dye. We used our um, HIV specific antibody fragment, the 647, um, to label the HIV infected cells, as you can see here. And then we also include a caspase 3 activity tracker. So anything that turns blue here is basically um, a dead target. So let's just focus on this infected cell. So you can see that the NK cell rapidly interacts with the um, antibody loaded target, and then it quickly kills it. And this is over a period of about one and a half hours. This is in contrast to what we see with the macrophages, where you see almost seven NK cells interacting with a single HIV infected macrophage at any point in time, but not much happens. Um, and we've extended this out to multiple hours and we just don't see the same amount of killing of the macrophages that we do the CD4 T cells. Um, but again, you know, we want something that's a little bit more of a population-based analysis. And for this, we go back to our flow cytometry we look at um, the NK cell response to um, infected CD4s without um, HIV antibody or our control antibody. As you can see, we have some innate recognition here, so an increase in degranulation and cytokine production over the infected target. 
And we get a massive increase in CD107A and TNF-alpha um, when the NK cells co-culture with the infected cell with PGT121 or 3BNC117. So this is your very strong, very potent ADCC activity. This is what the field has expected. When we co-culture the NK cells with our infected macrophages, again, we see some innate recognition. This does go up with the addition of 3BNC117 and PGT121, but I would say that this is not really biologically significant, maybe a little bit with PGT121, but it's nothing compared to what we see um, with CD4 T cell um, ADCC. And this is true um, for both the 3BNC117 and PGT121. So it looks like the ADCC um, responses to the infected macrophages are much more muted or limited. And of course, when we take this home and we look at the killing of the ADCC mediated killing of infected CD4s, um, great potent killing using either 3BNC117 or PGT121. So you can see that the PGT121 antibody enhances killing. So this is the loss of the infected cells. We do see some killing of the infected macrophages, but you have to use a very high effector to target ratio. And even across the lower effector to target ratios, you can see that the PGT121 just isn't really boosting um, the NK cell response towards the macrophages. Mm -hmm. And all this together just basically means that the ADCC um, activity, killer activity towards the infected macrophages is significantly less than the ADCC activity to the CD4 T cells. So just to summarize what I've shown you here for this second project, I've shown you that the NK cells can recognize infected macrophages through innate receptors. What those innate receptors are um, is still under investigation, but that the macrophages trigger a cytokine response while limiting degranulation to, and we potentially think that this is how they resist the NK cell mediated killing. I've shown you that the HIV envelope can be expressed at the surface of the macrophages and that they can be detected by HIV antibodies. I've also shown you that the CAR T cells can recognize and kill HIV infected macrophages. Um, but even though the HIV envelope and the antibody are, even though the HIV envelope is expressed at the surface and the antibodies can recognize the macrophages, um, NK cell ADCC is just inefficient compared to, um, is inefficient to macrophages compared to the ADCC of the CD4 T cells. Um, so let's talk about big picture. We're thinking about macrophage as a professional antigen presenting cell. And as a professional antigen presenting cell is trying to coordinate immunity, it's trying to maximally stimulate um, cellular immunity. So as a phagocyte, if it, um, phag it, phagocytosis form materials such as bacteria and viruses, it can present this form material in MHC class two to stimulate CD4 T cells. It can present the material in the MHC class one through cross presentation to stimulate CD8 T cells. And through TLR activation and other stimuli, it can um, express various ligands that can activate NK cells. But a problem with all of this is that while the CD4 T cell interactions are relatively innocuous, so they're non-cytolytic, there's no perforin and granzyme, because the CD8 T cells and the NK cells express um, perforin and granzymes, they're potentially cytolytic. So the macrophage solution to all of this so that it can maximally stimulate cellular immunity is to develop a resistance um, to killing. And whether that's through um, resistance um, due to expression of granzyme inhibitors or specifically inhibiting other um, mechanisms of NK cell killing is something that we're looking at. So um, we actually think that macrophages are ideal hosts uh, for pathogens, not just for HIV, um, but one thing that we're looking at um, in the lab is whether other pathogens take advantage of this hard to kill cell type to help evade cytolytic immunity. And then in addition to that, we're um, asking whether there are ways to enhance macrophage killing while limiting inflammation. Because killing is all you know, well and good, but if you're gonna have this prolonged contact time between the two of them, this results in uh, excessive production of pro-inflammatory cytokine, and you know, this can enhance the disease pathogenesis. So efficient killing, that lethal hit where the CTL or the NK cell can detach very rapidly is really what we need. Um, so in the lab, just to talk about, you know, future directions that we have in case anyone is ever interested or you'd like to collaborate, uh, we have a collaboration with Brian Bryson at, and at the Reagan Institute to look at mycobacterium tuberculosis infected macrophages and how these interact with NK cells and CD8 T cells, specifically looking at the profile of the macrophages that survive the interaction of the C with the CTLs and the NK cells. 
We have a very nice collaboration with Elka Murberger at Boston University in the National Emerging Infectious Disease Laboratory to look at Ebola infection in the macrophages, again, looking at the interactions with CTLs and NK cells. And we've recently established a collaboration with Tim Qualick to look at CMV infection in the macrophages as well. And it's by studying the interactions of CTLs and NK cells with macrophages that are infected with different pathogens that we're, we'll be able to tease apart macrophage specific um, mechanisms uh, of resistance to killing versus the ones that are pathogen specific. And then finally, uh, we want to look at the pathways that are involved in macrophage resistance to killing. In terms of NK cells, we're focused on characterizing the NK cell receptor ligand pairs um, that are engaged with both the CD4T cells and the macrophages. And we actually think that what's going on with the macrophages is that they present an inhibitory signal to the NK cells that's not presented on the CD4s, and that's why the CD4s are um, better recognized. A second research focus is identifying pathways that antagonize perforin and granzymes. So these are the cytolytic molecules released by CD8 T cells and NK cells. And by using CRISPR screens, uh, we'll be able to determine uh, what natural granzyme inhibitors or what natural apoptosis inhibitors um, are present beyond what's, uh, what's currently known. And then finally, a collaboration that we have with Will Cornell Medicine, specifically the REACH Collaboratory, is focused on defining phenotypes of HIV-infected CD4T cells, as well as macrophages, which is our primary focus, that survive killing by CTL and NK cells. And what we think is that, um, at least our hypothesis, is that there's a common mechanism that the macrophages and the CD4T cell use uh, to resist killing by CTLs and NK cells. And this actually contributes to the persistence of the HIV reservoir, which is really hindering a lot of our um, based strategies uh, to eliminate HIV infection. Um, so just to finish off with acknowledgements, a lot of the work that I showed you was actually done when I was a postdoc in Bruce Walker's lab. So there were plenty of people involved in the study, many collaborative labs, uh, uh, collaborations that we had, including Hidaplo, Marcella Mouse, who helped out with our um, nanobody work and our CAR T cell work. Um, thank you to all the donors and the funding sources. And if anyone is interested um, in potentially collaborating, uh, please visit our website. We're also on Twitter. Um, thank you to all of our uh, collaborators and our funding. We're specifically part of the um, Martin Delaney Research Enterprise to Advance a Cure for HIV. Um, really trying to push the fact that, you know, macrophages also need to be, be considered um, with cure strategies. Um, so thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Clayton, for that wonderful seminar. It's really amazing. Fantastic work over the years. And I just want to mention that it's really fascinating to see all of these biochemical pathways that are listed in response to HIV infection, specifically in a number of different cell types. So I'm going to jump right into the questions because we've got quite a few very good questions from a very strong turnout in audience today. And I will start first and foremost with, uh, hold on one second. Jonathan Chan asked the question specifically about, uh, is the virus driving serpin B9 expression in the macrophage doing this to resist killing? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So back for our 2018 paper, um, we did look at GAG P24 expression versus serpent B9, and it didn't really look like at the protein level that there were any specific differences. Um, it was interesting that the that the H uh, sorry the macrophage did require granzyme B to die. So if you use caspase inhibitors or you use granzyme inhibitors, you could actually inhibit the killing of the macrophage, but this actually wasn't the case for the CD4 T cells. So for the CD4 T cells, the inhibitors really didn't work that well. And so the hypothesis that we formulated based on that data was that the CD4 T cells were actually susceptible to other granzymes that didn't um, signal through caspases like granzymes A, H, K, and M. But that because the macrophages required to die, a required granzyme B to die, that the macrophages were resistant to these other granzymes. And we actually think that it's inhibitors towards these other granzymes, which are potentially, um, uh, that are potentially enhanced with HIV infection that helps protect the macrophage. Um, but based on our protein data to answer your question, uh, it doesn't look like serpent B9 is increased with HIV infection, but the, the macrophages naturally express serpent B9. Great, thank you. Jonathan, I hope you got that. The next question is from Maria Jose Miguez. Maria asks, 
When you do your measurements, are you measuring actual replication or are you assuming that GAG24 positive cells are infected? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. We know that the GAG P24 cells are productively infected. So with HIV infection, um, you get entry of the virus into the cell, you get enc encoding. So the cells that are actually newly infected or pre-integration will be GAG positive. But the thing is, once you have an integration event and you get expression of the HIV accessory proteins like VPU and NEF, that specifically downregulates CD4. So that's why we look at CD4 versus GAG P24, because we're specifically focused on the cells that have downregulated CD4. They also have downregulated MHC class one. So that helps us distinguish between between pre-integration infection event and a post-integration infection event. So we're not actually measuring replication. We have also done some of these assays where we measure um, P24 production in the supernatant, but we specifically use flow to look at the productive infection that are GAG P24 positive CD4 downregulated to indicate a, pr a productive infection. Those are the cells that are gonna produce your virus. Great, thank you, Dr. Clayton. Next question is from Anwar Hawk. Anwar asks, is there any mechanism available to elucidate enzymatic biomarkers for NK cells during metastatic phases to pin out appropriate prognosis for cancer, for example? Uh, that's a little bit out of my field of expertise. Um, I'm not quite sure. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I, I, I can't really answer that because that's more that's of a, a cancer question. <laughs> That's all right. Maybe I'll have Anwar reach out to you directly by email sure. or something. Y'all can exchange info. Sure. Okay. Let's see. Jonathan Chan has another good question. Would downregulation of CD4 in HIV-infected macrophages limit the ADCC response? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think this comes down to whether the HIV envelope is in a closed confirmation or whether, at least the envelope that's on the surface is in a closed confirmation or whether it's in an open confirmation. And, you know, this is actually something that we're studying right now is whether um, MHC class one makes a difference for ADCC, CD4 makes a difference for ADCC. Cause you could imagine, for example, that a CD4 is, is present on the same surface as your envelope, that it could trigger the envelope and open it up. When the envelope opens up, it, it exposes all of these epitopes that can be bound by CD4-induced epitope antibodies. And those, um, those can definitely enhance ADCC. But the problem with the envelope when it's in its closed conformation is it, it restricts the, um, the antibody repertoire that can actually recognize that envelope. So um, I can't answer an exact yes or no, but I, I think, you know, what I can say is that expression of CD4 or lack of expression of CD4 might affect ADCC depending on the antibody that you're using. If you're using a CD4 binding site antibody versus like a CCR binding site antibody, I think it may be different. Um, I'm obviously not 100% sure of all the exact literature that's out there, um, but I haven't seen anyone to actually, actually look at that yet. Sure, okay. Thank you, Dr. Clayton. And Michael Leva asked a good question. He gave a little background here. He says, we know that exercise, infrared sauna increases interferon and heat shock proteins, which can upregulate NK cell activity. So what are your thoughts on heat stress to actually induce NK killer cell activity? Um, also not something that I can really ask because that's, we always keep everything that we have at 37 degrees, but I'm, I'm sure that's something that can be tested. Um, we know that if you give the NK cells a little boost of cytokine, like IL-2, all of our assays are done with IL-2 and a little bit of IL-15, and that mm -hmm. seems to help out the NK cells as well, but I'm not exactly sure what, what heat shock will, will do to the NK cells. Okay, no worries. And we'll just finish up with one more question. I actually had a question. It's a very general one. I'm not a virologist, but uh, your work with Dr. Walker at the Reagan Institute, you had mentioned, I think y'all studied a subpopulation of individuals who were resistant to either HIV infection or its progression to AIDS. And it was a CD8 positive T cell uh, population that was able to target specifically these constrained parts of the virus that don't mutate. Mm -hmm. uh, can you give us some examples of what those parts of the virus are? I mean, are they receptors or are they other types of proteins? 
Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. So actually, uh, the idea of CD8 T cells being important for natural control of infection actually came from a GWAS study. I think it was back in 2010, which suggested that for people that naturally control HIV infection, they can they contain a specific HLA allele called HLA B57, and this was associated with better control. What's interesting about that is B57 individuals can control HIV infection, but not all of them do. And I think a lot of the importance of all of that is the T cells that target the right kinds of um, peptides that are presented by the, by M on MHC class one that are part of the virus. So for example, there are certain gag epitopes, for example, like TW10 and KF11 that are, um, you know, immunodominant epitopes. So that's your primary CD T cell response that's going to be developed against that. What's interesting is that when you, when the virus tries to mutate away from that, it comes at a fitness cost towards the virus. So basically, um, there is a, and I think it was a science paper that was published a few years ago about this, but when you mutate those particular epitopes, it results in basically breakdown of certain protein protein interactions and so the virus just isn't viable. So the virus basically has a choice. It's like do I mutate to escape the CD8 T cell response but come at a fitness cost or do I keep that um, that particular uh, sequence, stay you know fit, um, maintain those interactions but be targeted by the CD8 T cell. So I think it's like a one or the other. Obviously it's a little bit more nuanced than that but effectively yeah. that's what it is. It's fascinating. The virus tries to maintain some kind of fine balance between evading being attacked and, and actually being able to replicate, I guess. Mm -hmm. so, fantastic. Very interesting. Uh, with that, I think we'll go ahead and finish up just very briefly. Before everybody uh, de departs, I want to mention that Sino does, in fact, have the world's largest collection of viral antigens, because I know there's a number of virologists and immunologists on the call, over 1,000, known as our Provir bank of viral antigens and corresponding antibodies. And specifically, I now want to thank all of the attendees who joined us today. Just very briefly, people from all over the world, the UK, Israel, of course, all over the United States, Iraq, India, Canada, France, Ghana, Kenya, Brazil, Peru, uh, Germany, and Pakistan. What a wonderful turnout today to hear Dr. Clayton's talk. And specifically, Dr. Clayton, we appreciate your time today. Fascinating work that you're doing. Uh, it was a wonderfully interesting seminar and we appreciate you taking the time to do it. And certainly we wish you all the best of luck in your future endeavors. And then finally, I'd like to thank my colleague, Christine Lay, who set up and organized and executed this BioTalk Tuesdays seminar. So with that, Thank you all again for attending. Dr. Clayton, thank you for your time. And we will sign off now. Perfect. And if anyone wants to contact me, if you have any other questions, I'd be, I'd be happy to chat with you. So please visit the website. All the contact information is there. Great. Thank, thank you very much. Have a good day. Take care.